You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rinal, and we're taking a look at the United Nations Security Council. Ask the citizens of Syria's Hula region whether the architecture of international security is working, and they will probably say no. More than 100 men, women and children were massacred there on Friday with guns, tanks, artillery and knives. UN monitors and many countries blame the Syrian government for orchestrating atrocities against its own people. But that doesn't mean that the world's top body, the UN Security Council, will agree on anything beyond a non-binding statement. Amnesty International, the rights group, says the 15-nation Security Council is tired, out of step and increasingly unfit for purpose. The group says that countries like Russia and China use their veto privilege to nix action that could save lives. One option is ditching the veto. Emerging economies want a more representative and larger Security Council. Washington hawks say it is redundant and tout an alliance of democracies as a more legitimate instrument of international power. So, does Syria showcase that the UN Security Council is a defunct organ? Should we reform the institution or scrap it and devise a system that doesn't pick and choose when to save lives? Or is it the best mankind can muster in an often lawless and scary world? To probe these questions, we're hosting a discussion in our London studios. I'm joined by Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International, Jonathan Steele, a correspondent for The Guardian newspaper, Stephen Schlesinger from the liberal think tank The Century Foundation over the line from New York, and Mark Entin from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. OK, to get the ball rolling, I'd like to get a single-sentence answer from each of you to the following question. First of all, to you, Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International, International. Is the UN Security Council fit for purpose? I believe that the Council is not fit for purpose. I think that everything that we've seen in the past year, especially, of turning its head away from everything, the, the terrible things that are happening on the ground of Syria, remind us of that. This is not the first time. We saw with Sri Lanka a few years ago, we've seen in past years many other examples. But the thing is, they have an absolute responsibility for prompt and effective action. Those are the words of the Charter. In terms of maintaining international peace and security, they have signally failed to do that, and I really think that needs to change. And the question to you, Jonathan Steele, is the UN Security Council fit for purpose? I think it's about as good as we can possibly get. After all, it is member states. Don't blame the UN, blame the member states. And uh, as long as we have tension in international relations, we'll have it reflected in the Security Council as well, and, and we'll never get away from that. And over to you in New York, Stephen Schlesinger. I would say that, uh, yes, the UN Security Council is effective given the circumstances we all live in. The fact is that if we didn't have the veto power, countries like Russia, China and the US would leave the UN. So we have to live with what we have to live with. And over to you in Moscow, Mark. The United Nations feeds the purpose, uh, but we do not forget that it's only an instrument. And it's an instrument in the hands of the states, members of the Security Council. So the lack of will or mutual understanding is what makes United Nations act or not act. Okay, Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International. Most of the other guests were saying that it's possibly a warts and all organization, but the best we can get. Now, your organization, Amnesty International, is calling for some kind of change to the nature of the Security Council. I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask you to go back a little bit and explain what the UN Security Council is and how this veto power works. The Security Council was set up after the Second World War, and its main purpose is what's described as the maintenance of international peace and security. And clearly agreeing with what a number of the other participants have, have said, we are better off with something than without anything at all. It plays a, a role. But what we've seen in recent years is that the importance, for example, of protection of civilians has been much stronger and it has the ability to take action. I think it felt particularly shamed by its failure to respond properly to the genocide in Rwanda in 1994, to some extent also the massacre at Srebrenica in Bosnia in 1995. There have been historical failings, and indeed Sri Lanka more recently in 2009, the Security Council looked away completely when tens of thousands of civilians lost their lives. In the past year, we've had 
many of the dramas across Middle East and North Africa, but specifically, clearly, ongoing, what we are seeing, horrendous, what has been described not only by Amnesty International, but by many leading UN officials as crimes against humanity. And yet the council, until this weekend, and that was a press statement, which is a complicated bit of the UN system, but not nearly as strong as a resolution, came out with some strong language. But that was after 10,000 had lost their lives. So as others in this group have said, yes, of course, it is the government. It's not the UN system as such that we're looking at. But nonetheless, this is the body which the government set up as part of the UN. And the way that it's working at the moment tends to go back to a lowest common denominator. And it feels to us that that is addressable. There's been a lot of discussion in past years, and we're eager to put that back onto the uh, agenda of the possibility of not using veto where genocide or crimes against humanity are being discussed and the very least for governments to be forced to explain their use of the veto rather than simply sitting on their hands saying, I don't like it, I don't want action, and more civilians die. And the veto, it, maybe it isn't so widely understood what the veto is. Now, the Security Council has got 15 countries on it. Five of them are permanent members. Can you explain how the veto works among these five and who these five are? Yes, broadly, you need a majority of the governments to go ahead with something. But as you say, five of those members, chosen really very much, if you like, the post-war architecture of the powerful government. So that was the then Soviet Union, now Russia, China, Britain, France, and the United States. Those form what's called the Permanent Five, or the P5, the Permanent Five members. Each of those Permanent Five members are allowed, if they vote against, that is a nixing vote, if you like. It becomes a veto. Whereas the other ten members who are on rotating two-year terms on the council and are, are chosen from all around the world, all of the members of the United Nations, those five Five, though, obviously have a particular responsibility in the sense that they can simply put up their hand and say, no, I don't like it. And that's what we've seen on a number of occasions on Syria. We have also seen it in different ways previously on Sri Lanka, on Burma and other issues. It can be literally lifting the hand to say no, or of course in the discussions leading up to a resolution, if it becomes clear that one of the governments is not going to vote in favour, people will sometimes back off even putting the resolution onto the table. And that's a serious problem. Problem. And we're talking in particular about Syria now because this is the most pressing situation that the Security Council has been charged with dealing with, where we understand there have been atrocities committed over the past months of conflict, and in particular just before the weekend in the Hula region where more than 100 men, women and children were reportedly massacred. Now, we understand that the use of the veto in the Security Council has been used in Syria and is kind of blocking this kind of action there, is that right? That's correct. So at the weekend, what what we actually got was an agreed unanimous statement. It wasn't the doesn't have the force for technical reasons of a resolution, but it was an agreed statement and it had some strong language which Russia also signed up for. In previous months, Russia has made it absolutely clear that it would not go ahead with that and therefore has put its foot down. Russia, it must be said, is not the only one which has unhelpfully used its veto in past years. So the United States has also, on a number of occasions, on Israel, for example, has used its veto in order to block agreement where otherwise all 14 members of the Security Council were agreed and the United States has used its veto. So this isn't just one country doing it. But on Syria, which you're asking about, which we're discussing today, both Russia and China have been the ones which have repeatedly said, no, let's wait a moment. Let's have a look. We don't know exactly. And the reality is we do know with enormous precision in where we don't know absolutely everything. It's because the, government, the Syrian government has been very unwilling to let people in. I wouldn't say, to be clear, that you know, no crime has been committed. I mean, it is very possible. We are seeing evidence now that rebel forces may be committing abuses as well. So it's not a matter of all of the violations are on one side. But the fact is, and both Ban Ki-moon, now Kofi Annan, Secretary General and, and the Special Envoy, have made clear that the Syrian government does bear a heavy responsibility. And it does seem to me, it seems to us, Amnesty International, consequences must follow from that in terms of real pressure being put for change. OK, I want to get the view from Moscow here, so I'm going to turn straight to Mark Entin from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Mark, what we're hearing here is that Russia has been wrong to use its veto in Syria and also that the veto right itself is wrong. Let's have a comparison. What is the number of times when the USA used uh, its veto power? We will see that in comparison with Russian use of the veto power, it's uh, much more seldom. 
So your argument isn't that Russia should have the right to the veto and that Russia has been correct in using this power to stop action on Syria. Your argument is just that, well, America has that right too and America has done the wrong thing as well. Not at all. I can say that the Security Council is a tool. You cannot say that the Security Council is good when it is used by the United States or a couple of other countries. You cannot say that the Security Council is good because it's used by uh, another couple of countries. So a Security Council could be efficient because it's just an instrument only when there is a unity among the members of the Security Council. <laughs> You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rinal, and we're taking a look at the United Nations Security Council. I'm joined by Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International, Jonathan Steele, a correspondent for The Guardian newspaper, Stephen Schlesinger from the liberal think tank The Century Foundation in New York, and Mark Entin from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Turning to my guest in the studio, Jonathan Steele, we're talking about Syria, and we're talking about Syria as a case where the UN Security Council has been blocked from taking action because two of the permanent members, Russia and China, have got no appetite for action there. What do you think about what the international community should be doing in Syria? And what does that say about whether or not the UN Security Council is the organ to be able to implement it? Well, I think it goes back to last summer and the Libyan intervention, which the Russians and the Chinese allowed to go forward by not vetoing it. And they felt, and I think justifiably, that they were tricked because they thought they were coming in to support a humanitarian action, which was to protect civilians in the eastern city of Benghazi. But it was used by NATO and the United States and Britain and France, the th those three permanent five members, to start an air campaign all over Libya to topple the regime. So it became regime change rather than protection of the civilians. And I think the Russians, therefore, are very leery of allowing that to be repeated. They have indeed criticized Assad on a number of occasions, indeed on an earlier presidential statement or press statement that came out at the end of last year when they criticized Assad for using disproportionate use of force. So it's not true that they've never criticized Assad. And they have supported, with the other four members, the setting up of the Annan plan. The Russians did not block it. In fact, they've been more enthusiastic about the Annan plan than some Western countries, and particularly some Western media and indeed the Syrian opposition, which has been constantly saying this plan is useless, it's hopeless, constantly being violated, because they have an agenda, which is if they can get the negotiations to fail, if Hanan has to give up, then they hope that finally at last NATO will come in, either with a UN resolution or even without it in the manner they did in Kosovo in 1999, without a UN resolution and just took action against that regime. And so I think the Russians are actually much more committed to a peace peaceful solution and negotiations in Syria, which I think is good and I think it's the only realistic answer that anybody with humanitarian interests at heart should support, than indeed the Syrian opposition or some Western countries. And so you're saying that Russian efforts to stop action through the UN Security Council is actually the right thing and the best thing to do? Well, they're stopping military intervention for regime change. We've seen that in Afghanistan, we've seen it in Iraq, we've seen it in Libya. It causes huge amounts of civilian casualties and the results are often unpredictable. There's the law of unintended consequences and it always comes into play when you have military action to change a regime. So I think the Russian position is understandable, but the, the other half of their position, as I say, is to support peaceful negotiations and the Annan plan and to try and send in more observers to increase the number, to get journalists in there, to increase this monitoring by journalists. So the Russians are taking a very strong action and they are, because of their close links with Assad, they are constantly urging him to be reasonable. Now, if it fails, that's not the Russian fault. They are trying. And they, the fact that they've got good links with Assad is very good because nobody else does. And just picking up on one other thing, you said that Libya, I couldn't tell if you were saying that was a, a good example of action or an example where action shouldn't have been taken. No, I was saying it was an example where there was UN unanimity. They didn't vote for it. They didn't veto. But the purposes of the intervention was changed. And so it became a regime change. And I think that is wrong. Is that entirely true? Because the resolution did use the phrase all necessary measures. That's pretty tough language well, well, for that, UN resolution. Yes, that's t all necessary measures is tough language and it's the normal 
standard use, meaning the use of force. They don't like to ever authorise the use of force, so they say all necessary measures. But what were the measures for? They didn't say to remove the regime of Gaddafi and to bring in a new regime. It said to protect civilians. OK, now turning over to Stephen Schlesinger, I'd be really interested in your take on what the lack of action through the UN Security Council on Syria says about the organ. I think many of us are disappointed so far in what the UN Security Council has done on Syria, but I think we ought to balance the ledger a bit on this. I mean, after all, the UN Security Council has acted in, in many other crises. Libya is an example, Afghanistan, Ivory Coast. Already there are 15 or so peacekeeping missions which the Security Council has authorized. It's not a defunct body that cannot operate at all. In fact, the reason why people continue to go back to the Security Council is it has acted in many occasions in the past. Now, in the case of Syria, I think Jonathan Steele is absolutely right about the conditions under which Russia and China have viewed what's happening as regards how we bring about any peaceful settlement in Syria. But it's, it's also an illustration of the sometimes incremental movement by the Security Council. Because there are these blockages due to vetoes, Sometimes the Security Council cannot act quickly and does have to act in a more gradual way. But it doesn't mean that there has not been some movement, starting with the Anon plan and now this latest condemnation which happened on Friday. So I think we have to look at this over the long term and see that historical forces and the way they interact with the UN sometimes take time. And we still have months to play out in this crisis, and we'll just have to see where it goes. But I think the UN is likely at some point to act. And more broadly, on the point that Steve Crawshaw raised, these failures of the United Nations Security Council to take action, we're talking about Syria now, you're saying it might act in the future, but we can go back to a number of situations where it failed to act, protecting Tamil separatists at the end of the civil war in Sri Lanka, the 1994 Rwandan genocide, or the 1995 Srebrenica massacre. Don't these events tell you that the world needs something better? Let me put it this way. Between 1945 and 1989, when we had the Cold War going on, the Security Council basically didn't operate at all. I mean, there were a few rare occasions when the Soviet Union at that time was not present, for example, in the Korean War, when the Council rose to the occasion. So for practically the first two-thirds of the history of the United Nations, it really didn't play a role of any magnitude in world affairs. Since 1989... Conceding the points you make about Rwanda and Bosnia and a few other occasions, it has taken a role in the first Gulf War, as I mentioned, Afghanistan, Libya. A lot of peacekeeping missions have been operating. So I think you have to look at this in a more balanced way and understand that, yes, the Security Council is an imperfect body. Yes, it was set up by the architects of 1945 based on power realities of that time as opposed to what it should be today. But it still functions and it still has done some things which have been very good for the sake of peace in this world. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rinal and we're taking a look at the United Nations Security Council. I'm joined by Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International, Jonathan Steele, a correspondent for The Guardian newspaper, Stephen Schlesinger from the liberal think tank The Century Foundation over the line from New York, and speaking to us from Moscow is Mark Entin from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Maybe I'll turn back to you, Steve Crawshaw, in the studio from Amnesty International. Maybe you can give us a fuller account, based on what you've just heard, about what you advocate for when it comes to the Security Council. You don't say get rid of the whole institution, you just say get rid of the veto. We absolutely don't say get rid of the institution, and we are always happy where we can see the glass as half full rather than half empty, and speakers have rightly described the history of how it was set up. To tick other issues that came up, I mean, the use of the US veto, yes, we absolutely have criticized that as well where it's been used as a blocking tool and we're not expecting overnight perfection but the thing is it has so signally failed both on Syria and Sri Lanka and that is a case where already something called the small five group of countries have put onto the table of saying we ought to have to make the veto something either that you don't use or if you're using it then at the very least you need to explain why you're doing you have to be able to defend it and it shouldn't be the case that because somebody as in the case with Russia and Syria for example has massively friendly relations and an extremely important arms dealing relationship that therefore they will keep quiet on what's happening in Syria and etc 
accepting Jonathan's point that some language was used, but broadly, again and again and again, strong language was punished. We oughtn't to be forced to make this a question of should there be a possibility of armed intervention or not. The reason that we're in a very, very bad place with Syria today and so late coming to some strong language, this means that 10,000 civilians have already lost their lives. If stronger action had been taken, which really just meant the Security Council waking up to what was happening on the ground at a much earlier time, after all the uh, unrest in Syria has been going on for more than a year and has been met with deadly force by the government forces from the start, the violence on the side of the protesters started way down the line. In other words, if we were able to address this at an earlier stage, many, many lives could have been lost and that in a more general sense helps for the international peace and security in the world which the Security Council is tasked to be responsible for and I do believe that in the 21st century in a situation where there is a fuller understanding the Cold War is long over and we can all be glad for that but the fact that his understanding that protection of civilians matters no matter who backs them it's not a matter of whose side is responsible for supporting this country or that country the protection of civilians matters full stop it matters for human reasons and it matters for the international peace and security of the world. Jonathan Steele's point was a bit broader than that though, wasn't it? There hasn't been a strong idea of what intervention should take place in Syria and the Russian decision to stop action and to use its veto in the UN Security Council was actually the right thing to do because there are no easy answers there. I don't think anybody's suggesting there are easy answers there, but we've seen this with the Security Council repeatedly. When the strong language comes from it, even condemnatory language, which can of course be criticised for being quote only words, but actually even quote only words can be extremely important and the lack of those in past occasions we've seen how it gives a kind of green light to those who are continuing with the killing to feel they can do it if the security council is looking away then it's regarded as fine so that's what we were lacking in the past year let alone putting the extra pressure of saying we need to have human rights observers in and on the ground you need to accept these human rights observers now we have some observers but it took a long long time to get there let alone the kind of sanctions the kind of standard array of pressures that Security Council is entitled to put, and that comes long before you're thinking about armed intervention, which clearly Amnesty has no brief for supporting that. It can be extremely problematic, both in the human and the political sense, for many, many different reasons. So what we're all trying to do is to get the action, and there are many different ways of having that, of what's called the responsibility to protect is something which the World Summit a number of years ago, UN governments unanimously went along with. The Security Council has also endorsed it in the meantime, and you can not simply sit on your hands and say, well, it's a bit complicated. Yes, it's complicated, but that's what the Security Council is there for. Mark Entin, in Moscow, I'll put that one over to you. I've heard lots of different arguments for how the Security Council could be reformed over the years, but this is a tangible one. The, the permanent five members of the Security Council, Russia, China, the United States, the UK and France, if they use their veto, they should at least have to explain why they're using it. Yes, of course. And you may just follow the discussion inside the Security Council to be quite aware of this fact. It's very difficult to achieve a peace when there is a civil war situation or a religious war situation. Of course, uh, everybody is responsible for the losses of human lives. You must do your best to prevent such kind of losses. And for this purpose, the uh, Security so seconded uh, on our mission and sent him to see what could be done by international community to achieve stable peace and to end the reconciliation. Without reconciliation between different camps, a uh, stable peace will not last a moment. So what's needed? What's really needed uh, is not general discussion of the efficiency of the Security Council or, or uh, this or this attitude, but strong support all members of the Security Council and those who are outside Security Council in G20, for example, in the European Union, for example, and other places of this plan. Because if the, such kind of support is lacking, it's much more difficult to achieve its uh, uh, ends. So the, the main idea is to is the overcome price to achieve stable peace on the basis of what was seconded by the Security Council. As far as the you know, discussion of the reform of the Security Council, it has been discussed for many, many years now. There are special structures, special framework for negotiations to look what could be done to enlarge the Security Council, to make it more representative, to comprise all new players who could make their 
value added to the work of the Security Council. But such kind of changes would be done only when there is a consensus between major players. So what's needed is a consensus, how to reform, who must be new players, new members of the Security Council, and in what sequences it must be done. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rinal and we're taking a look at the United Nations Security Council. I'm joined by Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International, Jonathan Steele, correspondent for The Guardian newspaper, Stephen Schlesinger from the liberal think tank The Century Foundation over the line from New York, and speaking to us from Moscow is Mark Entin from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Okay, we're running out of time here, so I'd just like to quickly turn back to Jonathan Steele and Stephen Schlesinger and find out whether or not you agree with Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International's point that the UN Security Council does need to pay more attention to protection of civilian lives and whether or not there's any way that we can make the institution work more in that direction. First of all, to you, Jonathan. No, I definitely think they should. And in a case like Sri Lanka, it, the UN has had a report saying how many civilians were killed and, and the government was largely responsible and the government should now have an inquiry. So they are pushing. And we shouldn't forget the UN other agencies. I mean, the UN is not only the Security Council, it's all these tremendous agencies like the World Food Programme, UNHCR for refugees that do a terrific amount of work day in, day out without any publicity. And we don't want to throw that out of the window. So I think, you know, let's, to use Steve Crawshaw's phrase, look at this thing half full and half empty. I think the UN is a tremendous organisation. There are faults there, but we should not undermine it by uh, saying it's useless. And Stephen, in New York? I think that the reform of the Security Council is unlikely over the next decade or so. There's been many efforts over the last 67 years to, by smaller states to either eliminate the veto or broaden the veto and change the co composition of, of the council itself, and none of them have gone anywhere. And the fact is the five countries that hold a veto like the status quo and are unli unlikely to change it. So I think we have to appreciate that reality and work within it. Now, within it, there are possibilities. Right now, there have been discussions of a Yemeni-type solution in Syria, and apparently Russia has shown some interest in that, where you remove the president, but you put in a new president who at least represents some of the constituencies that already are in control. So I think the Security Council, again, within the limitations that it has to face, is flexible enough and still dynamic enough to deal with, with the issue that is ongoing right now in Syria. Okay, and I'll turn back to you, Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International, for a final comment. The other guests seem to be agreed that the UN Security Council, warts and all, take it as it is. I think we need to believe in the achievable. The body is there, it can do more, it hasn't done more. I mean, we were talking of the different uh, tools at its disposal. One we didn't talk about, if you're seeking a stable piece, is accountability. These things can be referred to the International Criminal Court. It's wonderful that that court now exists. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has also said that she believes it's appropriate. But the Security Security Council needs to intervene, as it has done on Libya and on Darfur, but failed signally on Syria. That kind of accountability, that's the kind of thing which can help give us a peaceful future and have an enormously important role. That was Steve Crawshaw from the rights group Amnesty International saying that the United Nations Security Council needs to raise its game when it comes to protecting civilians in countries like Syria. I was also joined by Jonathan Steele, a correspondent for The Guardian newspaper, Stephen Schlesinger, over the line from New York, from the liberal think tank The Century Foundation, and over the line from Russia by Mark Entin from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rinal. Stay tuned for the latest update of what's making headlines around the world. Of the states, members of the Security Council, to the lack of will or mutual understanding is what makes United Nations act or not act. 
Okay, Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International. Most of the other guests were saying that it's possibly a warts and all organisation, but the best we can get. Now, your organisation, Amnesty International, is calling for some kind of change to the nature of the Security Council. I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to ask you to go back a little bit and explain what the UN Security Council is and how this veto power works. The Security Council was set up after the Second World War, and its main purpose is what's described as the maintenance of international peace and security. And clearly agreeing with what a number of the other participants have, have said, we are better off with something than without anything at all. It plays a, a role. But what we've seen in recent years... You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rynell and we're taking a look at the United Nations Security Council. Ask the citizens of Syria's Hula region whether the architecture of international security is working and they will probably say no. More than 100 men, women and children were massacred there on Friday with guns, tanks, artillery and knives. UN monitors and many countries blame the Syrian government for orchestrating atrocities against its own people. But that doesn't mean that the world's top body, the UN Security Council, will agree on anything beyond a non-binding statement. Amnesty International, the rights group, says the 15 nation secure Jonathan Steele, a correspondent for the Guardian newspaper, Stephen Schlesinger from the liberal think tank the Century Foundation over the line from New York, and Mark Entin from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. OK, to get the ball rolling, I'd like to get a single sentence answer from each of you to the following question. First of all, to you, Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International. Is the UN Security Council fit for purpose? I believe that the Council is not fit for purpose. I think that everything that we've seen in the past year especially of turning its head away from everything, the, the terrible things that are happening on the ground of Syria, remind us of that. This is not the first time. We saw with Sri Lanka a few years ago, we've seen in past years many other examples. But the thing is, they have an absolute responsibility for prompt and effective action. Those are the words of the Charter. In terms of... The British Council is tired, out of step and increasingly unfit for purpose. The group says that countries like Russia and China use their veto privilege to nix action that could save lives. One option is ditching the veto. Emerging economies want a more representative and larger Security Council. Washington hawks say it is redundant and tout an alliance of democracies as a more legitimate instrument of international power. So does Syria showcase that the UN Security Council is a defunct organ? Should we reform the institution or scrap it and devise a system that doesn't pick and choose when to save lives? Or is it the best mankind can muster in an often lawless and scary world? To probe these questions, we're hosting a discussion in our London studios. I'm joined by Steve Crawshaw from Amnesty International. Jo Maintaining international peace and security, they have signally failed to do that, and I really think that needs to change. And the question to you, Jonathan Steele, is the UN Security Council fit for purpose? I think it's about as good as we can possibly get. After all, it is member states. Don't blame the UN, blame the member states. And uh, as long as we have tension in international relations, we'll have it reflected in the Security Council as well, and, and we'll never get away from that. And over to you in New York, Stephen Schlesinger. I would say that, uh, yes, the UN Security Council is effective given the circumstances we all live in. The fact is that if we didn't have the veto power countries like Russia, China and the US would leave the UN, so we have to live with what we have to live with. And over to you in Moscow, Mark. The United Nations feeds a purpose, uh, but we do not forget uh, that it's only an instrument, and uh, it's an instrument in the hands 